So I want to start with a story. Um, there are two companies, Fujifilm and Kodak. They have very different business fates, one might say. So let's kind of look at what happened. So Fujifilm, just as Kodak, had very strong core technologies. But Fujifilm, unlike Kodak, actually was looking for opportunities outside of the industry. And then they looked a lot. And they actually found a really, really nice match. Many people don't believe it. Cosmetics seems to be completely unrelated, but actually it is very tightly related. Actually, Fujifilm had made cosmetics a high-tech industry now. Because it turns out that uh, ultraviolet rays, they fade pictures, but also they damage your skill, skin. So actually, Fuji, Fujifilm knew how to control that. Also, to produce film, of course, you have to have very advanced manufacturing facilities, like nano level, et cetera. Turns out, if you make something very small, it can penetrate your skin. So, you know, skin absorption by cream was not a problem for Fujifilm. Also, um, quite a coincidence that collagen is a main component of film and skin. So, they had a lot of experience dealing with collagen, you know, on a variety of levels. And maybe you don't realize it, but all that makeup is, is actually optical control technology. Uh, if you have some blemishes, you want to make them unnoticeable. You use foundation to control the way the light reflects. So as you can see, it's kind of a perfect match. And the Japanese cosmetics industry is very, very competitive. But Fujifilm has been able to get a pretty good chunk out of it. It's a very high profit. So they're doing quite well. So basically, you have very strong, strong core, and you should really be imagine, imaginative. And then they kept doing it. Uh, so for example, they started doing other health and beauty products, like supplements, hair care, started kind of moving up the health chain towards diagnostic equipment, because they know how to control the light, how to measure it, uh, doing uh, nano-level drugs, also even getting into regenerative medicine. So they are really expanding their market significantly. So as you might imagine, the profits didn't decline as for many companies in the film industry. A film, I mean, photo film. So you don't have to expand into other industries by just using technology. You can have some ideas, uh, business models, anything that's unique, you can probably try to apply it to some other industries. So there is this, used to be a small company called Gojek. It's basically Uber in Indonesia. I think a month ago they raised $1 billion from Tencent. So they're not so small anymore. Uh, but you know, just as Uber kind of tried to do things, hey, they actually were a little bit earlier than Uber with many of the approaches. But I'll just show some of the initiatives. So I guess similar, they actually started with giving rides on a motorcycle. Then they kind of did the deluxe version with a car. And you know, similar to Uber, they did, started doing delivery. Food, shops. They also became a regular delivery company, delivering them products. Um, also, they, they can now deliver medicine to your house. And also, interestingly, they said, well, we can deliver services to your house as well. So for example, somebody can come and give you a massage at your home. So you don't have to you know, drive for 30 minutes, be in traffic jam and stressed out, and negate the effects of a massage. Somebody can come and clean, fix your car, and even do makeup for you at your home. So they really went in many different directions. They have their own payment system, so they're just kind of getting into a variety of areas. So cross-industry, it actually gives a lot of opportunities. So actually, a lot of strategic management companies finally starting to take notice. So Accenture says that a lot of your future growth opportunities will be cross-industry. But as you might know, it's very hard to motivate companies to innovate. I think there's a phrase that you, get fire, you don't get fired for not finding growth opportunities, but you do get fired for losing market share. So in a way, to motivate companies to innovate, you can say, well, if you don't innovate in, inside of your own market, you know, bringing in new technologies, new approaches, somebody else will, and they will take your pie away. So it's kind of just the different side of the same coin. But luckily, I think many executives are starting to realize that you do need to innovate. So why don't they innovate? The problem is 
most of the companies' analysts, or internal and external, they look on only at few and kind of mostly related industries. So it's kind of yeah, thinking inside of the box. So what we try to do is try to make them think outside their own sector. So we can show all kind of cross-industry activities. And of course, many of them could be very crazy ones, but hopefully one of them will spark something and then will re result in something that's good. So we have actually alpha version that works 90% of the time. Um, it's free for non-commercial use. So if it doesn't work, write me an email. I'll try to fix it. Uh, so also all the figures you see here have been produced by the program. So here is one of the studies we did on educational games. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the way we do it is we get a lot of data on startups, about half a million. Then startups are tagged by industries or different aspects. Then you just push all this data and show it in a network format. And then actually very nice patterns em emerge. And then as a academician, you can make a lot of different series of why. Or as a practitioner, maybe you can try to search for some interesting areas which uh, might be useful. And I think kind of thinking of it as ecosystem is also important because it's not just you know, Excel sheets. You, can, you really want to see how things interrelate, which areas are blooming, which ones are outliers. Um, well, I already mentioned that part. Sorry about that. So this is educational games. And sorry, the links are a little bit hard to see. But we can kind of see a lot of different clusters. And then you can click on the nodes, see the companies, try to get a gist of what they do. And I'll show some examples. So you know, educational games, we always think about K-12. But there are actually many different markets that can significantly benefit from it. So on the top, it's called Jerry the Bear. Turns out that child patient education is really not child friendly. Uh, so this company for children that have diabetes, usually the parents will get you know, 10, 10 pages that tell them what to do, then they communicate to their children. But you know, in the educational domain, we already know that's very easy to do. Habit forming, education, it's very well studied area. So this company made a bear that you learn what food to eat, how to measure your blood sugar, when, etc., forming good fab, uh, habits, etc. And it's interesting, so I think now they're in the 25% of the pediatrician's offices that treat diabetes. So it has been very successful commercially, but it's also doing very good things. So it's kind of win-win for everybody. Also, you know, educational games, turns out it's very good for hiring, for HR. If you make people solve some puzzles or problems, you can probably at least read out or find out the most exceptional ones, at least uh, free up a little bit of HR time. We can also look at different technologies used in different areas. You now we're using projector for 60 years. Turns out projectors are also good for playing. You can project things on the floor, make kids move. Everybody likes it. Uh, this one was a neuroscience transmitter used in medicine initially. Later on, the early adopters were yoga practitioners. Turns out also if we connect it on our head, we can actually see our learning patterns. I, am I being concentrating or not? So you can kind of get a lot of optimizations. Uh, I was suggesting that maybe you want to put it on your workers as well, but that's maybe slightly dystopian. But um, and, and nonetheless, we can also kind of look at, across different subjects. For example, instead of teach, uh, teaching music in a regular manner, we can teach music as language. Because some people are very linguistically talented, but musically deaf. I, I'm one of those cases. Um, or, you know, playing music through motions. It's a very different approach that some kids would be, relate much more to. And of course, we have different subjects. Um, so this is kind of work in progress. So we try to see what's AI in education, what's happening in that sector. So luckily, actually, at the very early stage, you know, the seed level, there's actually a lot of things across industry going on. So there's about 200 different industries or aspects of industries involved. So people are trying many different things. So we can kind of also look at different areas, trying to see, let's say, how's robotics different from image recognition. So you know, after clicking on many nodes and many sleepless nights, um, one of the main findings was it's very actually controversial, not crucial, unexpected, that actually AI enables a more natural interaction. Because if you think about it, 
when you got computers, kids were taught how to program, how to push the buttons, how to you know, drag and drop, which is not nece necessarily what they do. Kids play physically. So actually, AI enables us to actually make kids interact in a natural manner. It's sort of trying to force them to look at the screen all the time. So of course, one of the first parts is actually to be able to convert from analog to digital. So here's a very nice example. You know, it's much more natural to write formulas on paper, especially if, if you do linear algebra. Uh, it's a really pain to try to put in matrices into calculator. So this is a much nicer way, much more natural, I think easier to think. And then you can always feed it back into the computer this way. So one, once we can convert analog to digital, we can actually take the next step and then try to make entities interact with one another. So here's uh, some new startups. So here you can show different cards of actions that you want the robot to do. And also, as you can see, I mean, cards are analog, paper, paper. And the robot is kind of analog right? It has a marker. So as you can see, I think for many kids, this would be a very nice physical experience rather than trying to deal with some virtual entity inside of your computer. So you, know, you can read books. You can talk things out in a very natural manner rather than trying to you know, force it into some kind of putting kids in front of computer, simply. Uh, there are many different things you can do. So for example, you know, drawing, playing cards, puzzles, etc. And in a way, you can enhance those abilities with the digital device. For example, if you're stuck on puzzle, maybe computer will give you a hint. But you're still kind of doing it in a very physical way. Uh, also now that we can communicate, we can also try to adapt our communications because not everybody communicates in the same way. So here, for example, I love formulas, but many people get confused by symbols. So some people want to hear the formula, then they can understand it much better this way. So now we can actually very easily do it. Instead of showing the formula, we can also argument it with the spoken language and so the kids can learn better. Uh, this is very interesting, it's a type of picture, right? They use it especially for foreign language learning. You see a picture, you try to type you know, who is, you know, there is a tiger on the floor. Or well, opposite way, you can type something up and see what gets generated. So you get this kind of loop between visual and linguistic um, skill trainings. Uh, also for autistic kids, the way they communicate is very different. So you can use some robotic devices to try to teach them different things in a different manner that's more suitable for them. So now that we can actually communicate and we can adopt the communication, we can even try to start go after kind of higher up, more abstract things like motivation. So I think it was mentioned earlier that you know, college graduation is a big problem. So now there is a company that tries to place proper motivation materials, which could improve the completion, especially once you have a lot of data, you know, which bits would be more motivating, could be somewhat easily discovered by analytics. And for music, that's very interesting because, you know, in music they always say, you know, repetition, 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 and technique. So usually that's how it's been taught for, you know, many hundreds of years. Turns out actually motivation is very important and confidence is very important. So actually if you can boost those, then repetition will follow and, you know, you can get much better results. So right now, AI is just only touching a few sectors within education, but there are many more places where it can go together with education. Um, so all I want to encourage is to think outside of sector, because there are many really nice technologies, but somehow everybody goes after the, sort of the same market. There could be much better application somewhere else. At least you should consider them. And yeah, please give it a try. Hopefully it works. If it doesn't, please ping me. And thank you very much. Thank you.